When it comes to names, wrestling is just a nightmare. Every time you meet a wrestler, you're presented with the issue of what to call them. If they're still in their pomp, it's easy. You just go with what any announcer says as they walk down to the ring. If they left a promotion like WWE, however, or have gone through a personality change, what do you do? Summer Rae, for example. She's Danielle Monet these days, but would she rather be referred to otherwise? You just don't know. This is even worse for the talent themselves when they're brought in under a certain gimmick, outgrow that gimmick, usually because it sucks, and yet have established themselves too much to sacrifice their associated name. Which is dumb when you think about it, but that's wrestling, and that's why we like it. I'm Simon from What Culture, and this is 10 wrestlers whose ring names outlasted their gimmicks. Number 10, The Sandman. The Sandman, or the real life Jim Fullington, didn't always come to the ring to Metallica's Enter Sandman, and the name certainly had nothing to do with the dude that enjoyed smashing himself in the head with the Singapore cane. This is because on his first go around, the Beach Boys Surf in USA sang him down the aisle. Mr. Sandman also wore a wetsuit and sunglasses because, yes, he was meant to be a surfer a dude, hence the name. And if you don't believe me, he literally used to carry a surfboard with him. Realizing this was a terrible idea given where the industry was headed, Fullington embraced as much edge as he could and just reinterpreted his ring name to become one of the most popular wrestlers in ECW history. He could have switched it up to something more appropriate, like the beer drinker or something, but instead he just refreshed the character and transformed himself no end. Number 9, Crush. Brian Adams started out his WWE career as the third man in Demolition. Dubbed Crush to go along with the destructive theme of the group, he joined Axe and Smash in 1990 as they defended their tag team titles under the Freebird rule. Fortunately, by the end of 1991, this had all run its course and a change was needed. That saw Crush return the following year, but now he was a lovable Hawaiian beach bum. Now, weirdly, he should have actually changed his name to something like the Sandman, but instead he was still Crush or Kona Crush to his pals which is moronic. Clad in sunny colors and spouting words like brother and shaka bra, Brian Adams was anything but a man that was going to crush you. It was more likely he'd give you a coconut. He resurfaced once again in the WWE in 1996 after a year and a half hiatus that saw him get arrested and spend one day in a Hawaiian jail. And that experience was enough to change Adams further as he was now a hardened criminal with facial tattoos, piercings and dreadlocks but he was still called Crush. He finished his stint in the WWE as a biker and the leader of the Disciples of Apocalypse, but yes, he never changed that damn name. Brian Adams finally wrestled under his real name in Dubious Dubia, but by that point, you know what everyone kept calling him? That's right. Crush. Number 8, CM Punk. There's no two ways about it anymore. The CM in CM Punk stands for Chick Magnet, because Punk had to reveal that in a lawsuit. In this sense, it's actually good that most people do call him Punk, as it works more for his lifestyle, but there's no getting away from it. If we turn back the clock to his early days in the backyard promotion LWF, it's there where he formed the tag team of the Chick Magnets, consisting of Chick Magnet Venom and Chick Magnet Punk. Shortened to CM Punk, naturally, Phil Brooks took that name and spent the next two decades building a brand around it. And it's a brand that has crossed over from sports entertainment into the world of comic books and mixed martial arts. And to think he only got the name CM Punk because CM Benham's original partner didn't show up and a replacement was needed. Can you imagine if WWE had gone all in with this as well? Had Punk walking around hitting on chicks? Not sure it would have worked out. Number 7, Farouk. Ron Simmons wasn't fooling anyone when he arrived on Monday Night Raw in 1996 dressed as a gladiator. Announcer Jerry Lawler's first observation about the mysterious newcomer was, well, he looks like Ron Simmons. Because it was Ron Simmons. The gimmick was stupid as well, given he was given a helmet, an imperial-esque theme, and was meant to be from the first century something. Unsurprisingly, a few months later, this was ditched and the Nation of Domination was born. Amazingly too, the Farouk Assad name fit his new persona because he was now a black militant leader of a Nation of Islam-like group. After being kicked out of the Nation in 1998, Farouk began to team with Bradshaw to form the Acolytes, which would of course then evolve into the APA, who drunk beer and kicked people's ass. But even though he gambled, drunk lager and smoked cigars just like Ron Simmons, everyone kept calling him Farouk. Well, kinda. Most people at the time pronounced it Farouk. That was stupid. Number six, Road Dog. Brian James arrived in the WWE as Jeff Jarrett's roadie, known very creatively as the roadie. That one must have taken a while to come up with. After spending most of his run carrying Jarrett's water and setting up his microphones, the roadie, or Road Dog, wrestled for a few months, even making it to the semi-finals of the 1995 King of the Ring. He abruptly disappeared along with Jeff just as the two began a feud over who exactly sang on Double J's hit song. The roadie returned a year later as the real Double J, Jesse James, and exposed the long-gone Jarrett as a lip-syncing fraud. Asshole. A year later, he formed the New Age Outlaws, 
brought back his old road dog name, and used that for the remainder of his run with the company. Even today, when he does appearances, he's known as the Road Dog, despite not having roadied for anyone since 1995. And yet this is who he will always be. Wrestling. Number 5. Billy Gunn Sticking with the New Age Outlaws brings us to Billy Gunn. A relic of the new generation era where everybody had to have an occupation for some reason, Monty Sop would become a rodeo cowboy and with his fake brother Bart, form the Smoking Guns. They took this seriously as well as they'd fire off blanks during their entrances and once wore American football jerseys bearing the numbers .38 and .45. That's the name of guns. Billy would join forces with the Honky Tonk Man in 1997 to become Rocker Billy, which was over before it began as it sucked, and then he joined the New Age Outlaws as Badass Billy Gunn, as if this was actually his name. Even though a series of ludicrous nicknames followed, such as Mr. Ass and The One, Sop would always fall back on what brought him to the dance over two decades ago. He was even at All In recently, and you know what people were calling him? That's right, Billy Gunn. Even his real life son now goes by Austin Gunn. That's madness. Number 4. Albert Matt Bloom has used the name Albert for so long that it's only natural to assume that's his real name. It's not of course, it's Matt, I literally just said that, but he's pretty much been Albert since he debuted in WWE. Back in 1999, Bloom arrived on the scene as Darren Drozdov's personal tattoo and piercing artist who was very large and, yeah, very hairy. He was dubbed Prince Albert because he also did penis piercings. That's not a joke either, that's the actual name for having that done. Albert then spent the next five years in WWE trying different gimmicks and different variations on the Prince Albert name. He was the A-Train at one point, because who cares anymore? Bloom returned to the company in 2012 as Lord Tensai, trying to rid himself of the old for good, but fans had a very different idea as they just shouted Albert at him before he'd even thrown a punch. Now a trainer at the Performance Center in Florida, he is actually always referred to as Matt Bloom. Even though if you saw him in the street, Albert would just come out of your mouth. Number 3. Taz Given that most people's first reaction to hearing the name Taz would be the Tasmanian Devil from the Looney Tunes, you'd probably be surprised to hear and then check out the wrestler known as Taz. This is mostly because at first, he was called the Tasmaniac. An aboriginal wild man character from the island of Tasmania, he wrestled barefoot, wore animal hides and face paint, and even had hair. Clearly an insulting portrayal of the aborigines, this was more like something WCW would have thrown out there. It's not what the ECW faithful would have accepted, which is why Pete Senachia saw the writing on the wall and switched things up. So he relocated to New York, shortened his name, and became ECW champion before moving on to WWE and later TNA as an announcer, even though it doesn't actually make any sense. What is Taz? Number 2. Hunter Hearst Helmsley Hunter Hearst Helmsley is a name reserved for one kind of person, a pompous, grandiose, snooty, stuck-up snob who looks down their nose at other people. Named after newspaper heir-turned-bank robber Patty Hearst and tyrannical hotel mogul Leona Helmsley, the higher mighty Hunter Hearst Helmsley loaded his wrestling with effeminate verbiage and mannerisms. That was at first anyway. Throughout feuds over Sable and Marlena, Helmsley's attitude gradually gave way to a much more crude and crass take, culminating in a lengthy run with DX that saw the former Blue Bud moon the audience, urinate on motorcycles, and encourage women to flash him. This phase would have been an ideal time to abandon his kayfabe name for something less weird, but Shawn Michaels came up with a better idea when he took all the initials and pushed them together. I don't know why, Triple H just works. The best bit is, even after adding on nicknames like The Game, The Cerebra Assassin, and The King of Kings, his name is still, ultimately, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. You can never get away from that to the point WWE even double-barreled Stephanie McMahon's name when they got married on Raw. Because of course they did. Number 1. The Von Erich Family The Von Erichs are legends within wrestling, but also a tragic story in what the business can do to people. What makes that even stranger is that the Von Erichs were not real, because Fritz, Kevin, David, Kerry, Mike, and Chris were actually the Adkinsons. This gets even more extraordinary because the all-American sports family's name originated from a quasi-Nazi character that Fritz used to play. Happening in the 1950s, the Patriarch played a German heel whose job was to wind up fans still reeling from World War II. Billed from Berlin and wearing a large iron cross on his ring jacket to go with his iron claw finishing move, the implications were hard to miss and atrocious to be honest. Although his fictitious brother Waldo would take this even further and did so well into the 1970s, Fritz backpedaled from it enough to challenge for the NWA title title, promote world-class championship wrestling, and become an institution in the Dallas area. Fans in the 1980s did not bat an eye when the territory's top good guys all had a name that started as a dastardly foreign heel from the Third Reich. Of the first two generations of Von Erichs, only Kevin survives, but three of Fritz's grandchildren have tried their hands at wrestling, each competing under the Von Erich name and turning up in TNA. That's not so bad for a name, 
that has been outdated for well over half a century.